Hi everybody, welcome back to my book channel. Welcome back to Madame, part one of my trilogy. And I'm reading chapter one, a part one. And there's part one below. I'm the author, Patrick Lorcan Woods. I'm from Dublin, Ireland, but this is a story of Madame, a Protestant woman, that is asked by a priest to keep five children in secret. The question is, will she keep her end of the bargain? Because in return for keeping the, the children secret and rearing them at her estate called Linden Hall, Madame gets to get her estate rebuilt again. But as she observes, it's on the efforts and the backs and the sweat of the children from the workhouse, and this makes her very uncomfortable. But in the beginning, we are tracing the story back on the of the main character whose whole trilogy, this whole trilogy, is told through, through the eyes of this child called Nathan. Chapter one is Memories of My Childhood. When the van pulled away, I looked through the window and saw Father Peter handing, my mo handing over my mother some money before he got into the front seat. Ashamed of me witnessing her taking it, she guiltily blew me a kiss. Through the condensation on the window, I fingered the love heart with a mem underneath. Looking hard at my feeble effort, my mother cried out that she loved me as the van sped away down the street. Both my mother's tears and mine were ignored. Inside the van, Father Peter made me sit on a seat next to some other boys. A middle-aged priest checked my bones and smiled at me, telling me I would be a good worker in the fields. Frightened by his attire, I looked up at him. The colour black was something that was familiar but strange to me. I was frightened beyond my wits. A warm trickle of urine seeped into my shorts and down my leg. The piece of cloth I used as a handkerchief absorbed most of it, but then there was the rest. Watching me, the old priest suddenly laughed as he helped me clean up. Then placing me in the back seat of the van, he sat alongside some other older children. One boy whispered they were all going to the workhouse. The old priest whispered that I would be dropped off before the workhouse. Father Peter informed him that I was a special case. I was going to a woman called Madame who lived in a big house. Upon hearing this, one of the guys whispered to me, you lucky thing. The older people in the van teased me for going to live at Madame's. However, I barely heard them as I tried to console myself and figure out what was going on. Twiddling my thumbs, I nervously sighed and let out gasps of air in a huffed way. As the cold entered my body, I could see goose pimples appearing all over. Shaking erratically, I clutched my teddy bear for comfort until the van screeched to a halt. It was then that another priest opened the van doors. Calling my name, he told me to get out. Standing outside the van, I could hear the priest I knew to be Father Peter call out at the door window in the front of the van. He told the priest standing next to me to inform Madame that he would call over later. Then leaving us at the gates of some big house, the van with all the boys inside suddenly disappeared. The priest introduced himself as Father Ted and stated I had been chosen to stay here for the rest of my natural born days. The woman he would introduce me to would be my new mummy, he said, adding that I, would never, I was never to call her that, for she was a woman of distinction. This meant she was to be respected and adhered to at all times. I was going to have all the things in life for which I had ever wished, he said, adding it was good some day that my real mother would come back and take me home again. I asked him when it would be, to which he replied, not for a very long time to come. So there we were, outside a huge house overlooking the village they called Glendora. He told me to look at the village, for that was probably going to be the last time I would see it for a while. Traumatised, I could not say anything, for everything had happened so quickly. A man called Fred opened the gates for us, and as he did so, he looked down at me and winked. He asked me my name, and I told him I was Michael. He greeted me well, and told me not to worry, 
as Madame was looking forward to my arrival. She was a very nice woman, he said, even though she could be a bit eccentric at times. Immediately, Father Peter dismissed these claims and told me to ignore what Fred had just said. On arrival at the front entrance, he told Fred to go and fetch Madame at once. Fred replied that he was the gardener, not the messenger boy, and that he had better look for her himself. Fred then walked away. Father Ted cautioned me about becoming too friendly with Fred, as he said he was a simple man with no quality of life. Madame had taken pity on him, and Fred owed her a great deal of gratitude for employing him in the first place when no one else would. would. Then he looked down at me and he said there was protocol to follow on greeting Madame. I had to say yes ma'am, no ma'am, depending on the questions she asked. Father Ted asked me, did I understand? I nodded, even though my head was ready to explode from all the instructions he had already given me. Madame's house stood immortalised in, top, in the top of the field. High walls and tall mature oak trees made it private dwelling and it was very private indeed, secured even further by high-rise gates. They opened only for the coming and going of guests. It was a fortress like no other. It needed to be, for in every room in this house there had a story to tell. Father Ted informed me of the wooden double doors at the front of the house remained closed all the time. I imagined that the person who lived inside this home hid many secrets behind those large black doors. Outside were the famous gardens I had heard my mother speak about so often. I admired palatial ornaments that graced each corner represented the gardens here, with ornate roses and beautiful scented cottage flowers spread everywhere. The gardens at the front of the house drew you to the entrance like a honeybee, being totally immersed in the sweet smells that greeted you. Madame's home was an old three-storey Georgian mansion, set in the midst of an exclusive 13-acre site, surrounded by a further 70 acres of arable farming land. The top floor of the home was for Madame's use only, and Madame was an eccentric woman of 30-something years, who, to my surprise, had already taken on three other young occupants. I was now the fourth addition to what was an ever-growing family for her, Upon entering the dining room, the housekeeper Sheila, a solemn woman of 40 years of age, greeted us. As Madame sat and poured herself tea, three small boys around my own age ran into the room and immediately set, assembled themselves in military fashion in front of Father Ted, as Madame sat inspecting them. Excited and pulling at one another, they only stopped when Sheila had ordered them to, to stop from such nonsense. The three boys stopped their tomfoolery when Madame rose to speak and remained quiet throughout. My eyes wandered around her home, taking in the grandeur that surrounded me. The staircase led to Madame's room on the top floor. This had a rope positioned across the banister, and attached to the rope was a notice that read, No Entry. The middle part of the home had many rooms, many bedrooms, that the boys or guests slept in. The main area consisted of the front entrance, main hallway, dining room, living room, library, kitchen and pantry areas. This country house was old in character, yet distinguished. Built at the end of the 18th century, Linden Hall was unique by Dublin standards, for it kept many of its original features. The walls surrounding this home kept prominent thieves out and prying eyes at bay. It was simply beautiful. Nevertheless, the dark secret it hid from the outside world tainted what was potentially the perfect picture. When everybody found his or her rightful place to stand, Madame began to move forward. She walked slowly towards me, and as she approached, she introduced me to the other three boys. Their names were Tom, Adam and Marcus. I was shocked when she introduced them as my new brothers. They were to be my new family. But standing tall over me, Madame handed me a sheet of crisp white paper to read. It contained instructions so as to digest and follow religiously. If I became unsure of anything, then Sheila would help me. In Madame's absence, Sheila was in charge of the whole home and was to be obeyed at all times. Holding my chin with her delicate perfumed hand, I immediately felt my cheeks glowing. 
A touch sent a cold chill down my back. I became nervous, frightened, and shook it all the time. Madame reassured me with yet another stroke to the side of my face that was all going to be fine, and that with my new name, it would now be complete. My new name was to be called Master Nathan. I was to forget about my old name, Michael, forever. The other children in turn shook my hand and welcomed me as Nathan to, to their home. Madame finished by stating that even though priests were to tutor me, I no longer would be taught the Catholic religion. Instead, I was going to follow the Church of Ireland faith. Therefore, it meant that from that day, as well as having a new identity, I would also be raised as a Protestant. There would be vocal classes to rid me of my inner city Dublin accent, and in time I would begin to speak properly like a small young man. The staff was to call me Master Nathan from today also, and my new brothers would explain the other challenges to my lifestyle, and Sheila would guide me and monitor me daily. Madame stated that it was her duty to see that I conducted myself accordingly and eventually grow into a proper Englishman. Initially I walked with trepidation. I missed my mother terribly and spent hours either crying or cursing her for not coming to take me away. Sheila was a great source of comfort in those early days and Madame kept a vigil on me constantly. So to make sure that I fitted in more easily and without too much discomfort, they would visit me at night to hold me and give me emotional support. I never before explained, experienced the luxury of having an attentive mother, even if she was not my real mother. My lifestyle was like having, was like living in a big castle and feeling like the king of the castle. I had plenty of food now, a new education, fine clothes to wear, and many books to read. I shared it all with strangers that I now call my brothers and it upset me for a long time to come. My weekends consisted of lessons, something I never had to do before. In the beginning it was tough, for I did not know how to read or write, and Tom told me it was easy and not to worry, as Madame paid a lot of money to the church, and in return she had the best tutors one could have. Over time my Dublin accent started to disappear, being replaced with a well-spoken, polite, innocent accent. It was as near to the English accent that I could develop, given the circumstances. Only then did I feel I started to belong at Linden Hall, and I felt closer to my brothers as a result. We shared one common bond. We never questioned as to why we were prohibited from ever venturing outside Linden Hall. However, alone in my bedroom, I did spend hours wondering why I had been brought to live here in this secretive life with my new brothers. I'd spent even more hours agonising over the answer to that question, and after the first year at Linden Hall, this subsided as my confidence grew. I was succeeding in my lessons and had settled into my new routine. I was enjoying the company of my brothers. My voice was changing a lot, and I now knew how to read and write, and everything, the whole world was changing for me. I was finally being absorbed into my surroundings, and slowly and surely I began to cope with my adoptive home. Many a night I looked out of my bedroom window, out into the empty fields. I could see Glendora, the neighbouring village and the village's homes. I noticed that the windows flickered like wee stars in the murky distance from the lanterns inside that lit their homes. My mind, full of curiosities about this outside world, consumed me. I spent many evenings looking out of my bedroom window up over the wild oak trees and out into the darkness of the forest, engulfed by the walls of our home. Not knowing what lay beyond those walls of Linden Hall, my mind conjured up its own thoughts. I vaguely remembered one of the games my old friends, my former life, used to play. We pretend that I was Robin Hood and they were my fellow band of merry men. I wished that my new brothers and I could play in the forest. I would teach them this game. I tried in vain to remember my former friends, especially their faces. I tried also to remember where I once lived in Dublin. Over time, however, everything had become so hazy and blurred that it was all but a faded memory now. Through my solitary confinement within Linden Hall, I had become confused with everything. Through the long days and lonely nights, I had now almost forgotten my past life. The only, remind 
reminder, excuse me, was the faded photograph of my natural mother I had in my pocket when I first arrived at Linden Hall. Many times I sat and looked around my bedroom staring over at my brothers. I could not rid the feeling that something was not quite right. Yes, we had everything to keep our minds occupied each day. Yes, we were aloof from the real world. Yes, we were rich, privileged in all that we had and material possessions that anyone could want. Nevertheless, I needed answers to the many questions that roamed around in my head each day, not for my own peace of mind, but for those around me. That is part one of chapter one of part one of my trilogy, Madame Bittersweet Goodbyes. Thank you for listening. I will be back with part two. I'm hoping to get through as much as I can between now and July, because in July I will have my trilogy revamped, re-edited, new covers, all ready for summer of 2022 for you to purchase. Until then, I hope you will join me for part two of chapter one of part one of my tri trilogy. Until then, take very good care of yourselves. Take care.